My world as I knew it imploded. I was already negotiating my exit, having stood up to my bullying boss and his malevolent sidekick just one time too often. When my partner walked into the room, who was also a successful leader, and told me that our relationship was over. In that moment, I became homeless and I lost the children that I'd cared for for the last three years. So, it was round about this time, a year ago, when I was breaking the speed limit driving north on the M1, and I called Peter, someone who, at the time, I wouldn't really have put in the category as a friend, but I knew he was somebody that I could call and tell him what was on my mind. So I rung Peter, and I told him I didn't want to live anymore. In the days and weeks that followed, I had plenty of time to contemplate. And I started to think about the personalities and the traits of the protagonists in my life that had taken me to that point. And I started to become very curious about what they'd done and who they were. And what I started to realize is that we have a very single-minded view of what leadership is. That despite how far we think we've come and all the theories and the hypotheses, that we still stand with one foot very squarely still in the traditional paradigm. Now, thinking about what, some of what Dan said earlier, I was thinking about all the leadership events and workshops that I've been on in my career and thought of all the times that somewhere at the start of the day, I've stood around a flip chart uh, with a group of people and been asked the question, what is a leader? What do we mean by that? And I've stood around that flip chart with others and we've come up with a lot of the usual things that we would expect. That a leader is charismatic. They are successful. They are driven. They are great galvanizers of others in order to meet a very well-defined plan that they have. These are the normal things that we decide and define when we talk about leadership. And if we were to take that profile to our CEOs of our businesses and say, I found you this person, I found the person who ticks all of those boxes, I think most of us would admit that as recruiters and talent professionals, the CEO would go, when can I meet them? Or, following Dan's talk, when can I meet him? And um, would they want to join our organization? But who is that person that we're defining? That charismatic, driven individual, the one that gets results, the one who galvanizes others to do what he wants them to do. Because I think we might be describing this man. And whilst we might abhor what he did, I think that Hitler is one of the most successful leaders of our recent history. He's a man who had a plan, and boy, did he deliver it. He knocked it out of the park. In our nine-box model, he would be in that top right-hand corner as a star performer, an overachiever, probably our talent pipeline. But then we need to stop and think about what else does he represent. Because I think singularly we have tunnel vision around leadership. We define leadership always against a backdrop of what is good. To be a leader, per se, is a good thing, and we always talk about it in those terms. And let's face it, we have an awful lot of history, biology, and evolution that persuades us to that point. Nearly 200,000 years of evolution tells us that leaders, those that are successful, those that get to the top, are those that are driven, that have a goal, and go after it in the pursuit of power. But also, 
what that history and evolution tells us is that sometimes, to get those things, it pays to be a bit of a bastard. So, I think it's time that we start talking about the bad sides of leadership and not just about what is good. That we need to examine and remove our tunnel vision and start thinking about some of those more malevolent behaviours. And one of the analogies that I really like is the one that comes from thinking about um, if we send students through medical school. We would never train doctors by only talking about health. We train doctors by also talking about disease. And yet in leadership, we talk most, almost exclusively around what is good, but we don't talk about what is bad. Believe me, I've been out and researched it. There is very little out there. But we need to start talking about leadership in, re in relation to the disease as well as the health of it, because that way we can really start to understand leaders, leadership, and what it is that we want. So, nicely teed up uh, by Dan earlier on, I want to talk about the dark triad of leadership, something that I'm sure you may be uh, familiar with, and certainly um, some of the words um, in here we all already know. But it's important to talk about this and to understand why is it that people with these traits prevail in organisations. So let's start with the psychopaths. Psychopaths are quite exciting. With a psychopath, you never quite know what's going to come out of their mouth. They're a bit maverick. It's a little bit uncertain in terms of what they're going to do, and we get quite drawn to that. The other side of that, though, is that a psychopath doesn't care who they step over or step on in the pursuit of power, and boy, are they power-hungry. But psychopaths can also be quite charming and, like I say, quite attractive to us. A little bit like a narcissist. Narcissists, too, are charming. Narcissists, I have to say, I have a personal affection for. Narcissists are very impressive. They sell themselves to us because they really believe how great they are and they want to tell us how good they are at it and how much better they are than everyone else. We get drawn into that. I refer as narcissists as the peacocks. Those feathers are out and they are shimmying them in front of our faces to get our attention. But then you get the downside of a narcissist. Unlike Narcissus, the namesake of this particular trait, narcissists actually have a deep loathing of themselves. There's a void inside a narcissist that is so deep and so dark that they have to spend all their time filling that void. And they do that by trying to gain your adoration. And if you don't adore them, heaven help you, because they will wipe you out of the way. And then there's the Machiavellians. Now, Machiavellians are much more straightforward. You know what you're getting with a Machiavellian, because they know what they want, and they go after it. They are driven by their goal, and the reason that they are successful is that Machiavellians get results. They know where they're going, and they will make sure that it happens. So this is why they are successful in organizations. The issue with a Machiavellian is that they are very much in that command and control model. A Machiavellian will make the journey to the results extremely difficult and very hard to be around. But having worked in some fantastic organizations, having had some great opportunities, worked with some great people, and having worked for many different leaders, I think there's a lot of command and control that still goes on. When competitive pressures are there, when time is short, then command and control very easily and quickly creeps in. And that shortness of time, as Dan referred, is what we find ourselves experiencing in a modern workplace. And yet, 
we have here the dark triad of leadership. And there is a lot of bad leadership around. I have worked for some good leaders. But I'm sad to say of the many leaders that I've worked for, quite a lot of them have actually been quite bad. So my call to arms is around what can we do? We need to think about this dark triad. We need to think about the continuum on which these traits and behaviours operate. And we need to start talking in our organisations about the disease of leadership and not just the health of it. We need to find that dialogue and have the courage to do that and use it when we talk about our leaders and use it to promote and select them. But aside from, aside from just shining a light on them, I guess there's a question about what else that we can do. And that's where we come to one of my other passions. I have a passion for followers and followership. Now, in marketing terms, followers have gained popularity. We all are looking for more followers. And yet, what we don't do is see them much beyond that marketing tool. We still tend to see them as this amorphous mass. They're just one big group of people who sit at the bottom as the foundation of our leadership pyramid. But followers have types too. There are different kinds of followers. Followers sit right the way through that pyramid and right the way through our organisations. But they also have types and traits. This follower typology comes from my own research. And I think what's really key around it is the couple that I've highlighted there are because there are also dark types of followers too. So we ignore different follower types at our peril because it means that we don't acknowledge and recognize where those dark types also occur. But followers and their importance is on the rise which is why we need to spend more time, in my belief, understanding them, knowing how to develop them, knowing how to reward them, and knowing what we need to do to tap into them and make them the best asset we have. Not with empty promises of empowerment and engagement, by, but by through the methods that we reward and how we promote them. So these different follower types there's one in particular where if we want better leaders, if we want to remove bad leadership, then we really need to engage with and understand, recruit more of and promote more of in our business. And that's the challenges. Being a challenger or a whistleblower is very hard. It's a real skill to get it right, but when the chips are really down and we need to tackle that bad leadership, particularly that dark leadership, being a follower and being a challenger follower is really hard. Again, history brings us a cautionary tale about being a whistleblower. If we look back even in recent times, to challenge and whistleblow can be extremely costly. Whistleblowers often lose their jobs mostly lose their jobs. From that, they then lose their homes and often lose their families. And then, quite sadly, and what we don't talk about very often, is a lot of challengers and whistleblowers lose their lives. So we have to find ways, as recruiters, talent professionals, and business leaders ourselves, is how do we help those challengers we need to find a way to make the cost of conforming higher than the cost of challenging so that we help them and promote them through our businesses. That we make sure, as Dan referred to, that we don't let them down in our organisations. And we do that by understanding them and finding those mechanisms to support them. So the things that I'd like us to take away from today. We need to talk about leadership in relation to disease and not just in relation to health. 
we need to look at and understand that there are different types of followers, that they are not an amorphous mass, and that we need to work with them and for them in our organizations. And we need to make the cost of conformity higher than the cost of challenge, so that we don't look the other way when our followers and our challengers speak up. I had worked for a psychopath whose sidekick was a Machiavellian. I had lived at the same time with a narcissist. This time last year, I'd lost everything and I didn't want to live. I'd love to spend some more time talking to you all about how and why I did live, but for now, Thank you very much. Thank you.